So uh, Judy Yachin Lee May, who has four names, she makes, uh, makes jokes about that herself, is a phytoplankton ecologist in, uh, in my group. And um, she has compiled a bunch of information from a bunch of studies that have to do with the use of natural cestan, which is a term, I don't know, as ecologists, we use that term. Everybody know what cestan means? The cestan, according, so ecology is described as the branch of science devoted to the accumulation of arcane terminology. Right, that's the definition of that, that field of study, right? So um, cestan is all of the suspended particles in the water, living and non-living, um, which is a very diverse thing, right? I mean, if you look, here's, there's, there's sand, there's dust, there's um, bits of dead animals, bits of dead plants, phytoplankton, bacteria, molds, uh, protozoans, you know, so there's this, you know, this whole, spectrum of particles that are floating around in, in sea, suspended in seawater that are encountered that uh, you know a bivalve when it passes water through the shell is encountering all of it and so you know we you'll see the word here cestan quite a bit and you know we make different measurements and different attempts to um to know what the composition of that cestan is. What's the living component? What's the non-living component? What's the organic component? What's the inorganic component? You know, even in a diatome, the, the meat inside the cell wall is organic. The shell or the frustule that's made out of the mineral opal, um, silica, right? That's why you add silicate for diatoms. That's actually an inorganic part of the cestan. So you're gonna see these terms and I just figured I'd better explain it a little bit ahead of time so you you know you know what what I'm talking about and if you have a, a question like what does that mean just just please stop me so you know the phytoplankton within the cestan um, can be sorted a number of different ways um, by species is one way and you know so some have as we've talked about you know at great length yesterday some have high nutritional value some have low nutritional value some have zero nutritional value if they're not um, digestible uh, and some have harmful effects um, because they produce toxin or for other reasons but another way you can sort phytoplankton is by sizes and and shapes and that affects how well they're captured by this feeding mechanism I described that's based all on cilia creating water currents that trap particles. And those, you know, those water currents that trap particles do not select. The selection happens elsewhere, except for size and, and configuration in some cases. If the current of water doesn't trap a particle in the flow, that particle is not not trapped. So something that's too big or too small is not going to get caught in the flow of water that the, the cilia make. So that's actually from a bivalve standpoint, you know, in, in my opinion, um, this is the first important thing. Because something is not captured, it doesn't matter if it's harmful nutritional or not. It's not, it's irrelevant. And there's a lot of stuff that's the right size, shape, and you know, I mentioned the um, Maria Rosa's work on surface charge wettability and, and sugar. There's a lot of stuff that's not useful that, that's the right size and shape for capture. So, you know, it's, again, different ways of looking at this cestan in, in the sea, of which phytoplankton is only one component. So um, up where we live, we have um, successions in phytoplankton based on day length, on how many hours of sun, which you're familiar with now from Shannon's um, presentation. That some, it's, it's a lot like um, when plants flower uh, and when trees get their leaves and lose them in, in a, a temperate. I don't know what they call it, our latitude temperate. It's either too cold or too hot. So it's not, <laughs> it's not the middle, you know. But anyway, um, you know, how light day length is a big controlling factor. In, in a lot of photosynthetic organisms, including the, the plankton. Um, does anybody know, is there anybody here kind of a plankton ecologist enough to know how much 
of a succession you have in, in phytoplankton communities here? Do they really change a lot over the season or is it pretty constant? Fairly constant? Okay, so I'm not gonna actually, here, okay. I'm not gonna dwell too much on this, but it's just this is just for your information then of what um, farmers in higher latitudes are up against. <laughs> so um, here's day length over the course of the year and you can see you know it's quite a quite an enormous range between uh, the um, the solstices um, that um, propagates a, a quite eccentric temperature variation in our latitude from you know zero or less up to uh, 25 this is Long Island Sound uh, data from a, a paper I was involved in uh, quite a quite a while ago. Um, there also are very eccentric seasonal cycles in nutrient availability. Uh, and this is surface and bottom uh, data for nitrate. And what you can see is during the summer, the nutrient availability goes almost to zero uh, every summer. And that's because all of the nitrate in solution in the water gets assimilated by the phytoplankton that are um, partying big time because they've got a long day. They've got, you know, 16 uh, or longer hour days in the summertime. So they draw down the, the nitrogen. Um, so physiologically, phytoplankton are starved for light uh, in the winter. And so the nutrients can redissolve as phytoplankton are, are eaten and broken down and, and re the contents are re-released into the water. And in the summertime, as the algae are partying, the uh, nutrient availability goes to zero. So phytoplankton is seasonally light limited all winter and nutrient limited all summer. So it's a challenge for, uh, for a living thing, challenging environment. Um, and here's um, what's this? Uh, silica data. It's, it's the same kind of thing. There, there tends to be much higher availability in, uh, in January than in, you know, in the spring and summer. Um, diatomes tend to bloom in the spring by us, and then uh, the silica disappears first. And then <clears throat> any alga that's not a diatome has a competitive advantage once the silica falls, because the other algae don't need silica as much. And so chlorophyll you know, follows this seasonal pattern also, again, with very high chlorophyll peaks during the summer and almost no phytoplankton in the water in the winter time. This is kind of okay as far as the bivalves are concerned because um, like oysters don't feed below six degrees Celsius. So the fact that there's no algae for them in the middle of the winter isn't, isn't that big a deal. But you know, in the spring, kind of matching when you put animals out to when the primary production comes up is, is an important consideration for farmers. And, you know, and putting animals out in the middle of the summer when there's no food for them can also be an issue. So, um, here's the kinds of, of algae um, I, that it's kind of just what I mentioned. I guess I anticipated this a little bit is we uh, two sites in Long Island Sound. We have diatomes dominating throughout the cold months and it's only during the summers that we see um, non-diatome taxa like dinoflagellates and, and, and small flagellates becoming important. So it's mainly a diatome dominated uh, plankton ecology, um, except in the middle of the summer when the silica disappears and the other algae have a, have a chance at success. Um, returning to the idea of what's the, the size distribution, uh, here's some Milford Harbor data. And um, I was talking to somebody, like what size do, do shellfish generally um, consume the most of. Um, they're, both oysters and clams will not get any of this less than two micrometer. Um, that just actually isn't trapped in, in the filtering and the, the feeding uh, clearance process. Um, the two to five and the five to 20 are trapped pretty well. The two to five at about 50% um, efficiency. The five to 20 is really the best. And the, the over 20 are, are, are pretty well assimilated. So what you can see is, um, as we go through the winter, there's not much. And um, the, the first spring bloom starting in February, middle of February, is dominated by larger 
uh, the larger size classes of phytoplankton. So that's actually good news. And in the midsummer, we still have quite a lot of large phytoplankton, but a larger proportion of the, uh, the phytoplankton part of the cestan is cells that are too small for shellfish to catch. Now this is a problem when people use chlorophyll as a measure of food availability, because if you measure uh, chlorophyll, you know, here in, um, that's May, I guess, um, less than half of the chlorophyll is going to be um, the usable part of it. So more than half of the chlorophyll you measure is gonna be useless stuff. And that's something, if you have constant um, kind of phytoplankton community here, it would be a really good thing to know, the size distribution. There's a bunch of different ways to do that with filters or with a flow cytometer or something. But you know, your sites, as you do site evaluation, there's places we worked in Chesapeake Bay and um, in, in a couple of sites where the, in, in August, the fraction of cells too small for oysters to capture was about 85%. So the water looks green. It looks like it ought to be delicious, but they actually can't catch the stuff. So size consideration is kind of a big deal in, in, you know, in phytoplankton ecology as far as bivalves are, are concerned. So that's two micron size, but I guess it goes. Yep. So yep. Yep. And so, I mean, really dense blooms, so they're not feeding on like quasi eels? No. no, no, I mean, you know, and they, they may capture some of it with poor efficiency, pass it to the labial palps. They may reject it at that point. They may ingest it. Um, if it's cyanobacteria or um, eustigmatophytes, the most common things that that would be, um, they don't digest it and they use all that energy and, and get, get no uh, return for it. And, so, yeah, I mean, it's funny that, you know, bivalves can starve to death in green water. And it has to do with, you know, size and digestibility. And, and those two things are usually together. The small cells are almost always indigestible. So, um, so here's like, you know, a little bit of a, a summary of, of um, Long Island Sound, the, the diatome uh, domination through most of the you know, the, the winter, spring, and, you know, into summer. And then summer, we have this diversity of things that sometimes includes um, harmful species like um, Prorocentrum minimum, you know, and uh, in the fall, the diatoms return again. And, you know, I guess there's like always a concern in summertime in our latitude that we're going to wind up with, um, with harmful algal blooms. And there's a, there's one now uh, that, that known as rust tide, it's um, Margolephidinium polycricoides, has that for a mouthful, um, but it's a dinoflagellate that's really toxic to shellfish. Uh, it's been a problem in Korea for uh, several decades, and it has actually in you know the mid-Atlantic and New England become like a real killer, especially in nurseries, um, you know, um, flupsies, flupsy kind of nurseries become a real killer of, uh, of oyster seed. So, you know, it's things to know about the, the plankton in terms of size and the, uh, the species distribution. That for, for size is important no matter what, species distribution, in my view, is only important if there's a, a harmful or toxic species there. That actually, you know, if something is, is eaten and digestible, it's providing some return for the, the filtration effort. But, uh, so, yeah, here's you know some nice pictures that Judy took of um, di diatome blooms, and uh, there was a euglena bloom that she took a photo of, and that's a, that would be a summer thing, and this would be a more typical uh, yeah, dinoflagellate bloom would be a summer thing also, and then the winter spring diatome mix. I, I showed you another big picture yesterday of, of what that looks like. It's a lot of diversity, and knowing all the species that are present is is not important or necessary. Uh, you just want to know that there isn't something harmful. Um, so Judy um, presented a bunch of information about variability in terms of size and um, 
and what kind of what kind of algae are present what why do shellfish care uh, and this is a, another cool experiment uh, well three three different experiments that will show you a little bit of data from that uh, that we did in our lab one of them a raceway tank experiment with bay scallops um, another uh, muscle filtration experiments in in, uh, in Bronx, New York. That was a pretty cool study site, actually. It was like the urban dystopia. My team, members of my team hated that year. Actually, we spent two years working there. And then um, a Flupsy experiment in a place called East Creek Embayment uh, in the conic system on Long Island in New York. So the scallop study was done in, in our, our lab's raceway tank system. It just pumps water in um, the tipped up end and reliably gravity takes this to the, the downhill end and, and dumps it back into the sound. We put um, you know, scallops at a density that um, we knew was um, kind of sustainable in there. And we did um, daily measurements of feeding over a two week period. And this was in uh, in the summertime, so we had you know some diversity in the plankton. But here's um, the feeding uh, rates. And you see, there's a lot of variation in uh, you know over just a two week period, a lot of variation in in feeding by the the scallops on the natural cestan. Um, we kind of considered you know data from oysters relevant to scallops. Actually, this curve. There's curves for most of the bivalves that we grow that look like this, that tell the particle retention efficiency. Again, I told you oysters uh, below four micrometers, not 100% efficiency or retention. Above four, they're pretty much 100%. Scallops actually are more like five or six. So the curve for scallops is up a little bit more. Um, so in addition to total clearance that um, showed in, in two graphs ago, um, Judy measured the clearance of different um, size classes and you know this was in fact very nice because it was consistent the less than twos were cleared at relatively low efficiency compared to the larger ones that were you know retained and these um, 5 to 20 was you know the, the best uh, removed from a natural community so they're they're doing selection they're doing that you know both in retention and also at the labial palps with the, the process I, I described. So they're doing, you know, in a real life situation, they're doing what we expect them to do from uh, controlled laboratory experiments. That's, that's good news. So we know what the, the experiments are applicable. And here's, um, this is clearance um, summarized from that last graph um, of the different size classes. And again, it really emphasizes that the five to 20 um, size class of phytoplankton is really the one that's contributing most food to the base scallops in, in this situation with that particular plankton ecology. So, you know, again, if, if you want to do site evaluations with clams, you kind of need to um, make sure you, you got an idea of what the um, retention efficiency is. And, um, you know, if you have too many small cells or too many big cells that are outside of this, this pocket, it may not be a good site. If your you know, site is dom dominated by very small things, or during a season when you may have blooms of very large diatomes or dinoflagellates, uh, and you see reduced performance in the field, you know it may simply have to do with um, the the size and and the efficiency with which particles are captured by clams. So that's the the bottom line from from the raceway experiment. Now uh, the work we did in the in the Bronx. Um, this was work that um, Eve Gallimani, uh, who was a postdoc with me for two years, um, brought this apparatus. It's a brilliant um, apparatus. It allows us to measure all of the important filtration, clearance, and selection variables in a bivalve in the field in like one day. It's incredible. And all you do is you put um, individual bivalves, we worked with mussels in the Bronx, individual bivalves in these chambers and each chamber has a flow of seawater that's very precisely controlled. And you have a couple of units of these um, set up with um, actually um, 16 muscles. And then there are two in each side, two of these um, lanes with empty muscle shells. And all you do is collect water samples periodically from the, the head tank that 
that feeds these, and then you collect feces, pseudofeces, um, over a time period of, of like four hours. Um, so you have, you know, water. So what they what they're exposed to, how much they capture and reject, how much they capture, and um, and pass through the digestive system. And you take these filters and you put them in an oven, you dry them, you get dry weight. That's the total weight. And then you burn them in the oven uh, in a muffle furnace at 450 degrees overnight. And you burn all the organic off. And what's left is the inorganic fraction of the cestop. And that's constant. That has to equal 100%. You have to account for all of that. And then the organic part um, can be calculated by difference. And you know this method comes with this apparatus but also with a spreadsheet where you simply put in the filter weights and in the back, in the pages behind the front page, the data entry, all of the filtration and feeding variables are calculated. And this was Eve's PhD in, in Barcelona. And uh, you know, as I said, we brought her for a postdoc to, to apply this uh, to, to our work. So yeah, the site, as I said, it's, the planes taking off from uh, LaGuardia Airport came right over us, like really low. So you couldn't talk, like when it was a lot of flights going in and out, we basically couldn't even talk to each other. It was pretty intense. And then there was this uh, garbage barge loading thing where the garbage trucks would drive out here and dump their contents onto barges that were brought out to the um, 12 mile dump site. Um, that was not operating while we were here, so it was just kind of a derelict facility from that age. Um, so, <laughs> and then we had um, a raft of mussels, uh, a main mussel aquaculture raft out in the East River Tidal Strait, right off of the South Bronx, um, to see about nutrient remediation by mussel aquaculture in a, in an extreme environment. You know, and the bottom line of the study is it didn't work because there was so much um, silt in the water. The East River Tidal Strait has two um, tidal bores um, converging, one from New York Harbor and the other from Long Island Sound. And that whole tidal strait is like a washing machine and the, the sand never settles out of it. So it was just too much sand. Uh, but anyway, we did learn a lot about filtration and feeding and um, I can show you that, that you know, um, we compared uh, this site in the Bronx to Milford, and you can see there's a lot more organic uh, material in the Seston in Milford than in the Bronx, like more than, uh, well, twice as much, basically. Um, the chlorophyll in Milford was nice and high, you know, low of three, but 15 was more typical. Um, in the Bronx, we had a maximum of only about three micrograms per liter chlorophyll. So very little phytoplankton. It was a low chlorophyll, high nutrient area, which is usually what you find under ice in the Arctic. So, and that's because the silt was blocking light penetration and the phytoplankton were light limited all year long in the Bronx. But um, you know, it gave us a really nice contrast <laughs> for uh, a study of, of muscle performance under different nutritional um, kind of situations. So, um, we have the first variables in a comparison. So, you know, Milford uh, clearance rate is, is, you know, more than two, uh, less than two in the Bronx. Rejection percentage is 35% in Milford, 60% in the Bronx. So most of what they capture, they are rejecting at the labial palps. The absorption efficiency of what they actually swallow was the same in both places. So the muscles intrinsically, are just as good as extracting food from what they choose to swallow, regardless of what comes in, but in a place where there's not much they recognize as food and reject most of it, their performance is quite bad. There might be, yeah, there might be sites like that here, depending on wind and, and sediment mixing up, I don't know. Yes? That's actually a great question because I'm going to spend next week in Damariscotta, Maine with sea scallops in the biodeposition apparatus. We're doing a bunch of, of measurements up there. And we're bringing, we have a team of six people going because 
you have to stand over each one of those individuals with a pipette and, and grab the biodeposits as they come out. Now the flow rate is not so intense that they go flying out, but it's enough of a flow that you know if if you let a chamber go for two or three minutes, you're probably going to lose some. So we've got three people on on each of those things at all times with a pipette catching, putting it in. That's the like, the excruciating part of it, you know. But again, the the payback you get is is so great in terms of all these variables I'm I'm showing you, right? And we. The, the interesting thing, we modified Eve's apparatus to go on board a boat with a gimbal table and to stand on the boat where, you know, the boat is moving and the table is level, right, you know, with, with the chambers. But the way you perceive it is that this table is, is going like this and you're trying to catch the, the biodeposits, you know, as, as they go. People can, we need to take more than six people on a boat because people start to really get woozy, you know, after after a while of trying to do this, you know, but again, it's the only way really, you know, you know, to get data offshore. And that's something, another way we like to use this, this technology. Yeah. Something else, sir? Oh yeah. It'd be a great way to do that. No, no, I mean, this was, well, the, the purpose, actually, I mean, the purpose of this is to, Yeah, we've never done that. We've never supplemented the natural plankton with, with cultured algae. We use this as a way of evaluating performance at a site at a given time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, but, but, you know, like having, having a, you know, a read on what, how, you know, what they uh, assimilate, I mean, cause you get assimilation rate and efficiency here. There's a, a you know, another um, slide coming up, but you know, you can get, you get those numbers from this method and, you know, you can go to, to three sites that are different uh, in some way. And, and get a really good comparison using this method. You know, it's 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 best, really, honestly. It's you know, at its best, evaluating a, a local situation for the suitability of of the trophic resource. You know, and and you know, we've used this like at many more studies than what I'm telling you about. And you know, we, uh, if you want to see the shipboard thing, it's actually published in the Journal of Visualized Experiments, which is a really cool journal. It's a 20-minute professional video and a short written paper that describes what it's about, but it shows how the, the shipboard thing works and, you know, and gives them, that's the best introduction to it. So J-O-V-E and just put in, in my name or Eve, Eve's name or something. All right, so anyway, you know, there's these data, the absorption efficiency, I mean, that, that we find to be really constant for a species. And it's usually in the range of 60 to 70%. So what, they're all very good at, at um, what they choose to eat of, of, you know, under most circumstances, um, digesting it. And if you get a number substantially off of 60 or 70, you know, you have dominance of an indig indigestible species in that, in that place. So it's, you know, actually, you know, again, after a lot of studies, it's kind of, kind of interesting thing to know. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, and this was another finding, but it's not really relevant to this, this discussion. So um, the third study that, that Judy highlighted here is one from um, Riverhead, New York. And in case you don't know the map, this is 
Long Island. This is the coast of Connecticut. This is Milford where our, um, our lab is. Um, Manhattan is right over here. Um, that was where the Bronx study was right at the, the end of Long Island Sound. And so Riverhead, New York is in the, the, um, the armpit <laughs> of Long Island or the Conic, Conic ecosystem is here. And it's another like very, quite good shellfish growing, growing area. So um, we worked with Eros Cultured Oyster Company and Karen Rivera. I don't know how, how many of you know her, but she was really nice to let us work at her, her place. It was a Flupsy in, in a very small embayment. I'll show you a map in a minute. And um, so we measured, uh, well, it had, you know, you see the color of the water. It was like uh, antifreeze colored water most of the year. And there's Karen sorting some oysters from her Flupsy. She, um, she, she referred to this as her Jiffy Pop site because you know she'd put uh, oysters in the Flupsy, you know that that deep in the bottom of the silos, and they would double in bio volume in three days. So after a week, the pile would be like that. So you know, like very very productive systems. One of the reasons we we chose to to work there, um, but she also was having some issues with harmful algal blooms and you know and 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 bad periods and high mortalities. In an unexplained kind of scenarios, so we, we went there to see if we could um, could figure out what was going on. We monitored inflow and outflow of the Flupsy with um, data sons um, every fifth, taken data point every fifteen minutes for uh, for five months, I think. So we you know, had a ton of data to work with, and you know, over the course of the growing season, the temperature increased. The um, Salinity was, we had one big rain event here, right? You know, otherwise tended to increase over the summer because it was dry. Dissolved oxygen was pretty constant early in the season and, you know, got some uh, periods of uh, very large change. See this um, variation in dissolved oxygen actually has a daily um, cycle that I, I think I'll show you in a little bit. Um, the pH is not very well measured, but you can see there's, you know, stable for a while and then tended to get quite variable. Chlorophyll availability was always um, relatively good with some um, you know, quite notable blooms and, and down periods. And then the total turbidity um, that you know, rain event seemed to produce a, a lot of runoff um, and then some other uh, rain while well, we, we lost the sand for a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks there. But Anyway, um, if you look at um, this on a, a daily pattern, um, this is something you're gonna see here for sure, um, you know, in your growing areas. Um, the temperature changed a few degree, or, you know, pr proportions of a degree, let's say, but it did measurably warm during the day and cool during the night. There wasn't a diurnal um, cycle in salinity at all, so that, you know, and it wasn't really tidal, very tidal either. There wasn't much um, freshwater input. Um, <clears throat> the chlorophyll over the course of the day was, was fairly constant. Um, but with this change in temperature was a change in dissolved oxygen, which is partly because of solubility, but also partly because of respiration. Because what we see is the pH going down at night as respiration re releases carbon dioxide into the water, that carbon dioxide dissolves to carbonic acid. When the phytoplankton take that up, during the day the pH rises. So this is a natural chemical and biological ecology of you know, a nearshore growing site. And, I, and I, again, I, I, I think this is probably, with a very productive place like this, you're seeing similar cycles. And, and your, your clams are exposed to this. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you you see the daily cycles? Oh sure. Yeah. Actually, you know, that means they're young. I see a sometimes a daily salinity cycle based on time. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. So how do how do the oysters respond to this? Um Again, you know, doing some size analysis. Once again, it's encouraging to see that um, the small particles that they shouldn't be able to catch, they don't catch very well. Um, the five to 20 is, you know, a big portion. There are more big cells here. Uh, and these are oysters, not bay scallops. 
So this, the oysters seem to be a little bit better at, um, at catching the bigger cells, so they access a, a larger range of the, um, the, you know, the, the phytoplankton that are available. Um, this is um, continuous measure of oyster feeding by the difference between the um, chlorophyll in the inflow water and the outflow water. And, you know, you can see there's, oops, um, this is, you know, zero removal. And during this early kind of um, stable period of environmental conditions, most of the time you have net removal. When you have, you know, how are the oysters producing chlorophyll? Well, if they're um, pooping a lot of stuff that they ate previously, the, the number is going to be higher in the outflow. So, you know, you see um, these, we, you know, kind of doing some other measurements. We said, well, okay, these are the periods when they're producing uh, especially a lot of pseudofeces. So most of the time we have net removal, but when we get into this season where everything was kind of, the environment was changing a lot, um, we saw a lot of, um, of pseudofeces production. A lot of them, um, they were clearing stuff and, you know, releasing it without assimilating it. Um, and we wondered what else was, well, we were measuring what else was going on at that time. So this blip, um, damn it, this blip here was attributable to um, Protoperidinium syncocorna, which is a dinoflagellate that had never been found in this area before uh, and had never been known to be toxic, but it was coincident, and we think that's probably um, at least inhibited the feeding. And then this, um, what used to be called cochlidinium, um, and this week is called Markolephidinium polycricoides, um, was responsible for all of this mess. So Karen's observations about, you know, like great performance most of the time, and all of a sudden everything goes to hell, um, was actually pretty much attributable to a harmful algal bloom that, um, that she suspected, but we documented what it was and, and what the effect was, in fact, and it completely disrupted uh, feeding. Here's another really interesting finding. Uh, for me, this is the most interesting thing we found from this data set. So the, the dots are our clearance rate, I'm gonna do that one more time and throw this thing. Um, so clearance rate is the dots and the dissolved oxygen in the inflow is the, um, the, the line here. So we see the dissolved oxygen going down at night and we see the clearance rate going down along with it. And in this middle range during the morning as the um, dissolved oxygen is going up, we see the clearance rate come up, but the dissolved oxygen starts to go above saturation in the afternoon. The clearance rate plummets during the middle of the afternoon when the dissolved oxygen is above saturation. And when this falls, they start to feed again. So this tells us something about the environment, is that the both low dissolved oxygen and high dissolved oxygen inhibit feeding by the oysters. And it's probably because they stop um, respiring. They hold their breath for a while because this water is, is, um, is low and they don't get a lot of oxygen for the effort and it's uh, also low in pH. And then up here, there may be oxidative uh, stress, oxidative damage on the gills. Nothing to do with feeding necessarily, but they, they just stop. Um, they stop passing water through through the uh, through the body with gill currents, and they close up um, at night, you know, late at night and in the afternoon. So, kind of the one of the weird consequences of this is when you know when you're doing a study of bivalve feeding, you know, when do you go out? Well, you drive to the study site in the morning while they're filtering like crazy, and you arrive at the study site at 11 o'clock, you unpack all your stuff, you put your you know, things in the water, and you measure filtration rate here, and you assume, at this time of day, you assume that's what it is all the time. But unless you look over a 24-hour period, you don't see how responsive the shellfish are 
to the uh, the water chemistry and and the and uh, you know the the temperature and and the other things in the environment that change. So it's just kind of a um, a caution. And there's one of my favorite jokes is you know we're federal scientists and federal scientists are are famous for studying phenomena that occur between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4:30 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, if if it happens at night or on a weekend, we don't. Sorry, we, that's not you know not my job, but you know that's automation allows us to actually extend our <laughs> extend our workday, and you know um, there's a lot of um, follow-on actually to this observation uh, that Judy is working on right now about you know like how actually what's the most efficient way we can get um, you know be better understand the responses the feeding responses to environmental variation. And uh, and you know and also the you know the phytoplankton availability over, over a daily cycle. Um, right, you know the 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 water screaming through there, yeah. So here's some other interesting um, kind of data you can get, and you know I know that there's been discussion people here already about regulators and how the public relates. One of the other reasons we went to Karen's Flupsy in East Creek is she wanted to get um, a permit renewal to, to keep operating the Flupsy in this place. And it's a place where uh, it was in a little park and local people like to go sport fishing for bluefish and, and things like that. And the fishermen came out to the public hearing and said, we want that thing out of our bay. And you know, somebody asked, well, why? You know, well, because the oysters eat all the algae and there, so there's nothing for the bait fish to eat and we won't have any sport fish come in to East Creek anymore. So we want that oyster aquaculture the hell out of our bay. So, you know, we did some calculations. All right, what's the carrying capacity of this place? So, you know, with the data that we collected and some arithmetic, we figured out um, it would take 18 flupsies to clear the phytoplankton in East Creek. So having one in there is 1 18th of the, of the capacity, you know, is that, is that you know, for the community, is that worth it? Is, are the fishermen concerned about 1 18th of, you know, of the food, really? <clears throat> and then we did um, a, um, an in situ mesocosm study. I can't believe we got it published because those guys don't allow anything, but we managed to get it out, um, and, in which we did microzooplankton grazing rates. And um, I showed, you know, the removal of, um, of algae by the oysters and the flupsy you know, and the, that, that graph I showed you a while ago, the microzooplankton were feeding three times, 300 times as much uh, per hour than the oysters. So if the fishermen were really worried about the, the ecosystem and the, and the role of the oysters in there, it, it, you couldn't measure it if, if, you, um, you know, if you did a whole, uh, a whole bay kind of study. And then um, they were worried about, um, other people were worried about pollution coming from the oysters. Now the oysters are not, we don't add anything. We don't add feed to feed the oysters. The oysters are extracting their food, but they do in fact not assimilate all of what they eat and some of the waste, uh, they, they pee in the water. I mean, basically it's a simple way to put it. So is that gonna pollute the bay? And we actually you know, couldn't detect with a very sensitive method uh, Shannon was using, we couldn't detect a difference in ammonia from the inflow and the outflow. There was actually quite a lot of ammonia in that ecosystem because the microzooplankton were chewing down the phytoplankton and releasing waste as ammonia. So, you know, these again were, were data. We, we took, we did a, a big presentation at Town of Riverhead at a public hearing, um, a second public hearing for Karen's um, permit um, request, and, and it passed. You know, she wasn't prevented from keeping her flupsy there. It's not the only reason we did the study, but it's a great side benefit, you know. And uh, you know, it was a kind of a template for if there's public opposition for non-scientific reasons. If you want to bring science to the table, here's here's an example of of you know how it can be done. This costs a lot of money for us to do, so it's not the kind of thing you just do every place for the heck of it in case somebody wants to grow something there. But if there's real opposition to a, a place that's important, you know, there's a a way to way to do that. So um, there's one other thing um, that Judy is very actively working with. She has a postdoc now, uh, UUN Shu, who's doing a absolutely brilliant 
job of, um, of trying to solve this. How many people have used a YSI chlorophyll sensor? Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, science types, uh, academics, and state regulators use um, these fluorescence probes on, on YSI instruments that are either, <clears throat> you know, left in the environment or you, you lower it down and you, you, you press go and you get a number. Um, and the chlorophyll sensors read in micrograms chlorophyll per uh, liter of water. And it's based on red fluorescence that chlorophyll makes when you shine a blue light on it. And um, what we found that we couldn't explain in the East Creek study was uh, a daily variation in, uh, in chlorophyll fluorescence. Now the other figure I showed you a while ago that I said chlorophyll is pretty steady, that was made from extracted filters. So we filtered the ceston, extracted the chlorophyll, and, and measured the chlorophyll by a, um, an exact chemical method. This is fluorescence of the, the whole water. It varies like crazy while the chlorophyll itself that we measured was constant. So it's like, what the heck is going on here? Like the sensor is going crazy, but it's not just varying all over the place. It's varying very systematically every day going up and down. Why is this? So um, if you look at the same data uh, from different days, you know, on a, um, on a daily uh, kind of basis, so that's midnight and noon and, and the end of the day, what we see is the apparent chlorophyll goes down during the middle of the day and comes back up at night. And, you know, he said, well, is that because there's more feeding going on during the day than at night? Well, no, none of our data were consistent with that. So, you know, there's something different between day and night and, uh, and the fluorescence of the ceston in this ecosystem. So, um, I thought she had a, another summary slide. So I'll have to give you the, um, the kind of the punchline here. What it turns out is what UUN is discovering is that at night we're getting an accurate chlorophyll measurement because um, the fluorescence measurement by shine, that the instrument uses by shining a bright blue light on a sensor and measuring the red fluorescence of the water, it depends on all of the photosynthetic reaction centers being empty. In other words, the sample has to have been in the dark for the reading to be accurate. And during the day, as you're loading up the reaction centers with, um, I showed you that movie. So all of, all of the machinery of photosynthesis is busy during the day when it's light out. And the blue light makes almost no difference. And the red fluorescence, is much less relative to, to the blue light that's shown. And it's that ratio that the instrument uses to estimate chlorophyll. And so what UUN is doing, he's demonstrated this like very, very precisely with um, several species of algae. Now we're gonna do several more. So we have a distribution of different classes. And what he will be doing is writing an algorithm that depending on the, the time of day, the brightness, there's gonna be a bunch of criteria. If you can measure if you measure nothing else, tell us what time of day it is and what latitude you're at, and, and, and our correction factor will work in spreadsheet. Or, you know, if you can actually measure light with a light meter, we get a much more precise chlorophyll number from what the instrument reads. And we know from uh, informal discussions at a conference that YSI is actually interested in incorporating these algorithms into their instruments in the future. So, you know, it's like it's weird, um, unexplained, observation from a study has, you know, led us again down a path toward a, you know, a kind of commercial application. And, you know, if, um, again, a lot of state agencies, if you don't have continuous monitoring, you know, government workers arrive at work at eight or nine o'clock in the morning, they drive to the study site, they dip the thing in the water, they get a number in the middle of the day when they're underestimating uh, every time the amount of chlorophyll by quite a lot. So if we can have a, a correction to that, we have better data uh, that is you know, relevant to shellfish aquaculture because a lot of people use just plain chlorophyll as a, as a measure of well, how much, about how much algae is there. It's not really quantitative, but is it, or nutrition, is, is it a lot, is it, is it a little, is it almost nothing? So anyway, that's...
Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, but the, you know, they're the equations that UUN is fitting to the data are beautiful. I think we're going to be able to correct that. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, but you know, rather than throwing it out, you know, if there's a way to, to correct the technology, it's useful because the information people would like to have. Yeah. yeah. It was. It was actually, you know, the the probe was right at the inflow and at the outflow. And you know, that was, the, those were half a meter below the surface. But you know, whether they were pulling water from just that stratum or, you know. Um, we can exclude that because we, we can actually duplicate this under lab condition with varying solar or varying light cycles and so on you know in with cultured algae pure algae in, in a in a culture yep yep yeah no that's a it's a, it's a real thing and it really is you know the equations that are, are working are UUN's expertise is in um, physical chemistry of photosynthesis so, which is something like way above my head and so on. But it's like he said, this is the equation that, you know, should fit. And then we, you know, ran, ex run experiments with three species so far and, you know, pure cultures and, 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 and they're, fi they're fitting. It's like, yeah. Judy actually published the simplest correction you could possibly do in a, in, in one of the East Creek papers. And, and we know they're aware of that because they wrote to her about it and asked her some questions and everything. They may put, we'll, we'll have a better one after another year. Yeah, so. so anyway, this is Judy's, um, you know, big conclusions here. Um, there's constant change uh, that bivalves are exposed to uh, and, and they respond to it. But you think about it, that's where they evolved. So they, they ought to be pretty well equipped to do that. Um, there's, you know, some degree of size selection. Um, there's a lot of variability in feeding over the course of the day. So if you observe that, you should expect it and you should recognize that it, its responses to uh, environmental variation, both um, physical, chemical, and um, microbiological. And um, the long-term, you know, success of a site is influenced by um, the quantity and quality of the trophic resources is the way I would put that um, with, you know, especially, um, you know, the, the two observations that she highlights here are, you know, harmful algal blooms tend to really disrupt um, the performance of uh, everything in, in a shellfish farm and um, chronic low food uh, in some environments uh, like in the Bronx for unexpected reasons. Could, could be something that you would expect in an environment. And, you know, we've been like trying to, working with the Office of Aquaculture, there's some people doing mapping and so on. It's like, <clears throat> when people are proposing shellfish aquaculture leases in, in state waters, and actually we're trying to work this into federal waters also, there, there ought to be a site evaluation done first about the potential success that includes some of these criteria. Is it a place with a trophic base um, that ought to support shellfish? And um, the first you know, big push we've done on this, I have a postdoc with me now, uh, Darian Mazuta, who's an oceanographer who works with satellite data and also big data sets from monitoring programs worldwide. And she's been doing mapping of um, the Northeast Shelf 
for suitability for mussel aquaculture in three dimensions, latitude, longitude, and depth. So, you know, we're trying to kind of define um, opportunity zones for, for shellfish aquaculture, not just near shore, but offshore. And next week I'll be in, in Damariscotta, Maine with this team of six people. Um, we're trying to do the same thing for sea scallop aquaculture, which if you haven't heard, um, the lobster fishermen in mid coastal Maine are nervous about lobsters being pushed to the north by climate change because they're, they're having a, an absolute boom right now because the temperature is right on the verge of too, too hot. So the lobsters are growing like crazy and they're harvesting a lot of lobsters, but they saw everything to the south disappear up to where they are. And they're worried about in 10 years, they're not gonna have any lobsters to catch anymore. They have started a, a grassroots effort to culture sea scallops using Japanese uh, ear hanging technology, but they don't have any science helping them identify where are good places in terms of, of habitat suitability for sea scallop aquaculture near near shore. So that's what next week's project is to, you know, with Darien and she's organized this whole thing um, and, and a bunch of us to, um, to do, she's already done the modeling with the data. So we're gonna go to one candidate site that we think is good and measure, um, you know, that's good this time of year and measure with biodeposition, all the feeding variables, the sea scallops. We're going back in August to another site that is she, according to her model, is going to be a poor site. And we want to see a contrast between those two to, to, to validate her assumptions of how she's mapped out uh, mid coast Maine. So there's, you know, again, some science support for, for, uh, for aquaculture. And, uh, you know, there's not many of us doing it, but, we try to be responsive to, to needs. So I guess the other message is, you know, we're the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, not the Southeast, but the Milford Lab, honestly, we work with uh, Alaska, the West Coast, Gulf Coast, East Coast on shellfish aquaculture issues. If you have, if you communicate issues to us that you have that you'd like us to work on, we may be able to get some of those on the agenda and funded. There's no guarantee, but, you know, having industry ask for something helps us a lot. So, you know, I hope like some of the, what I showed you here and, and, you know, yesterday was more just about how to manage a hatchery, but today's stuff was, especially Judy's, some of the environmental things that are important in grow out um, that I think need a lot of work. And um, we, we should be putting our effort into things that matter to growers. So if you communicate that to us in Milford, we, again, we can maybe get it on, on our agenda and, uh, you know, collaborating with people who live here um, you know, do, do some science support to, to help you. So that's my, my last sales pitch. And uh, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Again, it's been kind of death by PowerPoint. When we do this in my lab, we, only, we do like only an hour and a half with the lecture, and then we go in the lab and do something. So we do a lot more back and forth. So I appreciate that you, um, you kept your eyes open through all this and so on. And uh, I encourage you to um, contact me if it's not me, I'm somebody in the lab knows more about your question or topic. Um, I'd be getting back to you. Um, and you know, one of the questions that that's the question. I'm here and for organize all of you because I didn't want to do any part of that. Or don't hesitate to contact me and know for by, by email. No, there's definitely time for questions. I wanted to ask you a question about the, in the hatchery setting. Is there something of the algae for these ratings or energy that you the way science? So I mentioned Reynolds numbers yesterday and I kind of glossed over it. It's it's actually also can be considered it's a, it's a measure of viscosity and movement. Okay, and um, Reynolds numbers are used by civil engineers to determine how big the pipe needs to be. The flow is not too much impeded by the friction of the, the walls of the pipe. So Reynolds number is also, uh, it's a measure of shear force, right? There's another way to think about it. And we actually did a study with, with lenders uh, and calculated Reynolds numbers in microalgae to find out
100,000 Reynolds number, um, you, you start to, to break cells. Um, at lower numbers than that, at 50,000, you, um, you, you um, can take a chain colony and break it into individual cells, but you don't actually destroy the cells. So, you know, how do you measure a Reynolds number? Well, so you need an engineer to do that, honestly. But, so, but most pumps, most pumps, even if it's not in the specs that you get, if you contact the company and say, can you tell me the, the, the Reynolds number in the rubber? The, the, there's an engineer who's measuring that. And they tell you 500,000, that's not a pump that you want to use to, to move out from one place to another. In, in with, uh, I mentioned the big foils in our big tanks that we used to have, they were going pretty slow. Nevertheless, the tip is moving pretty fast, right? Because the speed is the revolutions per minute multiplied by the radius of, of, of the foil, right? So, you know, out of the tip, we were running at about 20,000, a Reynolds number of 20,000, which is one fifth the number that was our threshold. So, you know, we were perfectly good there. But there are some pumps you know, that run a very high RPM with like a pretty big impeller. It's run of, of 500,000. It was one that we were using actually in position studies to pump water through the system from the environment. And we realized it's not something that kind of pump we use. Yeah. 